<laughs> All right. Uh, and uh, and yeah, today is Friday. Usually Monday we do a very official uh, live cast podcast, whatever it's called. This thing like super streaming. official. You've seen right? Yeah, right. <laughs> How official we've been so far. While Friday is very easy going and it's more brainstorming, it's more something for us. In fact, no announcement has been done. We're not sure it's actually streaming everywhere, but... Just think like you're a fly on the wall sitting in our living room overhearing our private chats about the future of technology. Sounds like uh, something you just call all the people following as a fly. <laughs> you know where the fly used to go? <laughs> To our channel because <laughs> they fly there very quickly that's what i meant <laughs> exactly. all right so we just came back for from lunch and during lunch we had a nice interesting discussion on the evolution of this blockchain that we are working on that we are uh, studying we are analyzing we are making happen and uh, because the vision of this blockchain is called ZooBC, Zoo Blockchain, because the company, our company is called Blockchain Zoo, and this was the Blockchain Zoo Blockchain. So Blockchain Zoo Blockchain Zoo Blockchain Zoo BC Zoo BC. The name that makes sense. It right? grows on you after a while. Exactly, it's growing here. See, it just grow <laughs> here. It grow in my shirt that says Zoo BC. It's, it's weird because it's inverted. Anyways. Now, the vision I was saying is long, is a 10 years of work of evolution where many things are gonna be clear going ahead when we see how the market is going, what are the needs, etc., etc. Other things are already clear now for how the final product should be. But uh, sometime being too innovative, too suddenly, Either you are Elon Musk that says us make rock, rockets to go to Mars and people laugh at you until you actually do that. <laughs> but it took him 10 years to get the first people in his rockets, though, with SpaceX. Or you start delivering step by step something that people recognize, find a little bit innovative. When they get used to that, you go one step further and so on and so forth. It's our version of Agile as well, because you don't always know exactly what you're going to start. We admitted to ourselves in the beginning that this is going to be an experimental process. So we're going to slowly, one step at a time, actually try. Oh, there's this nice big block where no <laughs> Is that going to be chat there? Okay. There is a chat. There's people leave comment in uh, underneath the Facebook uh, live stream uh, okay, or uh, in uh, the YouTube uh, or uh, whatever. We gonna read them that in theory because it's so small that we hardly can read it. <laughs> but step by step, right? Exactly <laughs> like I'm explaining. So um, when the, uh, the white paper for this technology, we explained that ZooBC is not just the name of one particular technology. It's the name, the umbrella name of a research initiative that we're undergoing where we're going to build a technology and try a lot of new things. We're going to run it in a live network and see how it works, see which parts are the most secure, see which parts add complexity that's not necessary, see where it's failing to meet the needs of people who want to use it. And then we're going to absorb this real knowledge into the next phase of what we're trying to develop. So we're going to proceed gradually and actually try to make multiple releases of the technology over time that incorporate the good parts try new things, throw away. It's going to be like, yeah, a very evolutionary process. Yeah. An analogy. We want to make a bicycle that fly. If we immediately produce a broom and a magic word that you need to sit on top of to fly, people think we're crazy. We start with a normal bicycle and say that people need to learn to run very fast. And then there is a small hope to make a small jump. And then we give some wings to the thing and slowly start flying. Exactly. <laughs> Or you have a, a friend from another planet that they want to call home eh, and they make your bicycle fly, which is our case with ZooBC. Now, oh, I just got an email from YouTube saying that we are live in our channel, so which is powerful. Fantastic. We understand why things were complicated the other time. <laughs> it's just a matter just go. Go and be live. Anyways. ZooBC start as a blockchain, like many other, because I gave a, a small uh, speech at the webinar yesterday with about 100 people, it was okay. And uh, in this webinar, we s were speaking where blockchain can be adopted, where it makes sense and where not. Rather than going through 100 use cases with example, 
I tried to approach with an explanation. And the explanation started in saying that uh, after the industrial age, we enter in the information age. And the information age started in the 1950s, where the first digitalization of information mm. started. Now is in the second phase. So information is digitalized. Music is made in number, is streamed, the audio, video, we are doing it now, is all digital, it's not analog anymore. Mm. And now is the moment to shift to the management of these digital assets. The problem of the digital asset is that uh, you can copy it. So a painting that a painter makes in his canvas is a unique copy and once you have it, it's yours. People can steal it from you, you don't have it anymore. But the digital art, for example, you just copy the binary numbers, paste it, and you have two copies that are identical. And so who's the owner of the digital art? Who belongs to if you pay a lot of money and the other person didn't? So the power of the blockchain in the phase of the second phase of the information era is the capacity to create singularity, uniqueness in the digital world. Because think about it, if I have a Bitcoin, and I give it to somebody else, I don't have it anymore. Okay, and that's a big difference that if I have an MP3 file and I copy and both yeah. have the MP3 I try to make concrete this difference. So, <clears throat> has anybody ever been to a movie theater and at the beginning of the movie, they show you this thing of like some criminals <laughs> running away from the cops <laughs> and it goes, you wouldn't steal a car, then why would you steal a movie and download it? And it's almost a good analogy, except that when you steal the car, the person who had the car no longer has it and they cannot drive to work and blah, blah, blah. If you steal a movie, the other person still has the movie and they can watch it. So we're talking about a different kind of ownership at this point. Absolutely. And blockchain is one of the very first things that's really bringing back the idea that a digital asset can own, belong uniquely to one person. Exactly. You can have a copy of my Bitcoin, but you cannot spend it, mm. right? Exactly. So you can have a copy of my digital art painting, but you are not the owner. Mm. I am the owner. And in order to show and manage the ownership of digital asset, blockchain is a fantastic tool, mm. right? Now, it starts blockchain to solve the problem of uh, a decentralized internet money, which is Bitcoin. It hasn't been invented. Uh, as an end, but as a mean to achieve an end, there was the financial uh, mm. uh, decentralized system, but it's one of the steps of decentralization. Torrent uh, has been a peer-to-peer -peer network to distribute file. They came from the need of the fact that uh, anytime there was a centralized distribution of files, it was shut down mm. and it was killed or, you know, Kim.com, eh? friend, <laughs> has a good experience in what it means to manage a centralized uh, file sharing system. In fact, after the trouble he got into, he immediately started doing a decentralized file sharing encrypted yeah. system. You guys know Mega. Who, you guys know who Kim.com is, right? Do you ever go to Mega Upload or Mega Video? Yeah, I bet you didn't. <laughs> Nobody ever did that because we're all in the file. But the analogy can be this if you are a bank, okay, that rent uh, safety boxes. And somebody used the safety box to trade illicit material, drugs, uh, child pornography, whatever, with other people. I go there, I have my privacy, I open the safety box, I put the legal material inside, lock it, hand the key to somebody else. This person go there, pretending to go in another safety box, open and takes the material. Now the police catch these people. Would the police uh, confiscate all the safety box of all the other people as well and shut out the bank just because the bank didn't even know that somebody was making an illicit uh, use? But uh, in the moment that there is a centralized entity in the old mechanics, which is the bank, uh, there's a risk that can happen. Many law enforcement will think twice to touch a bank. <laughs> but, but, but this happens in other cases, for example, uh, in email cases. You know, if, they, if it turns out that there's a company that provides emails and somebody sends some kind of suspected illegal email that they're communicating doing some criminal activity, very easily the law enforcement goes to the company and says, open the books, show me all the emails in your system. Which is the equivalent, I think, of what you're saying, that in order to check the fraud in one safety box, the government would go and open every single safety box in the bank. Mm. And it's, uh, that's kind of absurd. Yeah, it damaged people, that's nothing to do with the crime itself. Mm. First of all, the bank, 
Sen kommer man all the other guy into the bank. That's what happened. Funny enough, in the data center that the American law enforcement shut down, that belonged to Kim.com, which is a German national, mm-hmm. living in New Zealand, so has nothing to do except the fact that the server that they left were in the United States. Part, yes, was illegal piracy of movies and music, but a lot of other files deposited there were legitimate files. A lot of law enforcement offices were using hmm. that to distribute their own file, and they lost. People lost a picture of their wedding. People lost a lot of things. Because, uh, who knows, I, in my opinion, probably who gave the warrant to block the things didn't think hmm. through the fact that uh, you cannot block everything. It's like if somebody making a busy phone call, you shut down the phone in you know, the city, you know. But uh, at the same time, this is an issue given by centralization. Mm. Okay, so we're pretty far off into our rant that we like to give about why decentralization is better. But I think uh, it'd be more fun if we jump back into what we were talking about at lunch. What does all of this have to do with ZubiC version Hmm. 2? Probably this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to people unless they've been following closely what we already plan to do with ZubiC version 1. Okay. But for this stream, I think we're not going to go back and try to reconstruct. We have 150 pages white paper that you can read. <laughs> but there is one thing to say. Hmm. We approach blockchain evolution, so starting from the fact that it's been invented to manage the internet money, hmm. to the fact that people want to use it to manage... Uh, uh, trade, uh, mm-hmm. supply chain, uh, documentation management, etc., etc., thinking that the technology needs to evolve in such a way to support uh, non financial things mm-hmm. and to support, in terms of decentralized utilities that are now provided in a centralized manner. Mm-hmm. So, our brainstorming goes into creating the technological uh, base to implement solution that today are working fine and beautifully, but are centralized yeah. into something that should work fine and beautifully, but in a decentralized manner. Absolutely. And so this brings me to kind of, uh, at least my personal vision of what we're shooting for in the second version of the ZubiC technology. Now, I speak only for myself when I say this, because Roberto and I don't necessarily have the same vision. He and I both emphasize different concepts at different times, and we kind of work together and interweave our ideas to come to what we really think is the way to. It's very collaborative that way. But uh, the thing, the way that I like to think of what we're trying to accomplish with ZubiC version 2 is if you imagine some of these big, uh, big companies, there are a few big conglomerates that are doing... Uh, managed uh, hosting. So things like uh, the biggest one absolutely is Amazon Web Services. So if if I'm a startup, for example, and I want to deploy a website and the website needs to store a lot of files and the website needs to do a lot of processing and compute behind the scenes and it needs to have big databases of users and security levels and all these different things, Amazon Web Services has a giant list of tools, and I can go to Amazon and say, hey, run this on your computer, let me use your, on all of your computers in your cloud, and let me use all of your different tools, pick from this toolbox and connect the things, and then Amazon is gonna run all of my computers, all of my things for my system, and charge me by the minute. What we'd like to do with the ZubiC version two, or what I'd like to do with the ZubiC version two, is to take a step closer to building a decentralized cloud provider. So this means that a person, from from the point of view of the user um, or the application developer, the process is relatively simple. You write some code that interfaces with some tools, and the things behind it are able to scale by ways that you don't necessarily fully understand or have to know. Um, But behind the scenes, you don't have one mega corporation, which is Amazon, which actually has the keys to look inside every single person's computer. You have a whole network of computers where there's a free market and people can actually plug their computing resources into the system to support other people's applications. Hmm. So the idea is to decentralize the services that are now being sold in a centralized manner, Hmm. which is a goal, right? I think that ZubiC has the basic structure to evolve in that direction mm-hmm. very well. Um, and that's quite interesting because uh, in releasing the first version, we had to fight a lot to include things that would not make much sense mm-hmm. for what the first version is uh, releasing, but make sense in the moment that we start building 
things for the second, third, fourth, and fifth version, and so on and so forth, right? Because there are uh, technical structure in ZBC which are convenient relatively now, but which are essential for a moment where uh, different kinds of services are to be offered in a decentralized manner, right? Mm. So the thing is, for example, in the example you said before, set up want to launch a website, want to use resources, right? Mm. Uh, in a centralized manner, go to one company, they offer the service, this company has its own computer, whatever mm. they are, they give you a gate to enter yeah. this computer, and they charge you based on how much you use, okay? The mechanics should be identical in a decentralized manner. Rather than going to a single company that has many computers, you go to a collective of people that has many computers mm. and uh, pay them uh, for the use of their computer that you do. Each mm. person who contributes a resource gets paid by mm. the people using that resource in exactly. exchange for the use of their resource. It should, it should come out the same way, right? just rather than making one single company rich, uh, it has a lot of disadvantages because the maintenance oh, of yeah. this big data center is easy, is centralized, uh, they can buy hardware Absolutely. from a cheaper level because they buy in quantity. So it's not... Uh, but this is the thing that's a steep hill to climb to reach the level of efficiency they have. But once we're there, the number of advantages over having oh. it all centralized are unbelievable. <laughs> it's funny, I remember when I was a little kid, uh, going to school, uh, and we're talking elementary, so we're talking about 160 years ago, so you can. <laughs> the um, notebook for my class, uh, when I was going to buy, to do the shopping for a school opening shopping, which is a classic thing people do, there was the option to buy the notebook made with recycled paper. Hmm. Those were costing 10 times more than the normal one done uh, with uh, bleach uh, and uh, original trees, right? Hmm. Today, recycled paper is way cheaper than the original paper, and for a lot of reasons. They climbed the hill and crested it, and now the advantages and the price are better. And honestly, I think that probably if, maybe not in version 2, maybe not anytime soon, but if we manage to get to the point where we really solve all of these problems well, this could potentially become a much cheaper service to use than something like AWS and more reliable as well. Um, as something, it's it's difficult to imagine. It's beyond some kind of misty mountain peaks now. But uh, someday, I think we get there. We solve the problems. We figure out the architectural challenges. Mm. I think it's part of the natural evolution of uh, the information age, mm. right? So digitalizing, decentralizing, and uh, what will be the third phase <laughs> of this age is. Uh, leaving it i think is gonna be fruition uh, full fruition so, but <laughs> for context let's think about how far away this is from the current state of blockchain technology even the advanced blockchain technology like one of the standards that people still go by is the ethereum network which has accomplished a lot of stuff you know um and so the idea of this distributed processing on the ethereum blockchain right now in terms of a smart contract is that i write a piece of code and every single computer in the network executes that code to make sure that it comes to a conclusion. They're trying to fix this a bit. They have this plan to do sharding, so there's going to be small groups of the computers that have to process each piece of code, which increases the throughput a little bit. But think about how many of the problems to get to like an AWS type solution or a Microsoft Azure type solution that this doesn't provide. There's no kind of dynamic database that you can really you know, count on to add to access in an efficient at scale way. You know, there's uh, there's no kind of distributed file storage where you can think to. There's uh, this code that has to be written is in a very small specific sandbox and you literally pay per instruction. The user pays per instruction that they're gonna execute. There's no opportunity for somebody to say, pay a smart contract developer for a service and then the smart contract developer subsidizes the cost. So many, many things that we think can be improved to actually get us to that level of generality where we're not even close with other blockchains. Well, not to blame Ethereum because no. Ethereum was born. I, I saw a nice a uh, speech by, by Vitalik where he just said, well, we were trying to do something else hmm. more than Bitcoin. And so we were implementing a transaction that does this, a transaction that does that. There's a path that we went through when serving our clients, right? And he said, why should I start implementing different things? Why don't I make a way for people to code the transaction that they want? 
And I think uh, that's a fantastic Absolutely. step ahead. They did uh, an amazing thing. It's a fantastic way also to experiment and create. It's, the it's a step ahead, but it's important to realize that it's only a step ahead. And, and there's there going to be more. others. That's correct. And in fact, uh, in fact, I think that uh, Vitalik himself will agree, as he agreed in many other things, so, that uh, the need in the centralization brings uh, several other uh, aspects beside uh, the transactions, right? Yes. So you have data storage that is very important mm -hmm. and, and access to this data. Yeah. You have computation that is important. Uh, and uh, the fact, I think, uh, I think another analogy that I think is very important here. We start going to work with our car. A single person sitting in a large car, they consume a lot of gasoline and uh, pollute a lot. And I come take from a, America where this is the norm. Exactly. What happened? In many car, in many countries, people start carpooling for convenience because five people that live in the same area can go in the same car to work. They are saving a lot of money in gasoline, they are reducing the traffic. Mm -hmm. But in many cities, many countries, there are uh, lanes in the highway where you can go only if you are at least three people in the car. It's funny, this generated in Jakarta a new job of people that stand at the beginning of the road and get in your car just to get you go to the road <laughs> in exchange of a few dollars. And they stand up and they, <laughs> and they, they take run. it back the next one. <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> so, uh, because, you know, like there, are, there is genius in the world. But uh, the fact that uh, we are then moving to uh, car sharing systems in most cities in the world now, there are cars that you can check in your application where they are, you jump in, drive them around, drop them off somewhere else, because what you need to have a car full time for you, right? Mm -hmm. Now with cars that start driving by themselves, family would not need three cars anymore because the car, I go to work and then my car can go pick up on my wife and bring her and get the kid in school. The sharing of resources is an essential step ahead mm. to optimize the way the world is growing. More people in the planet, more we need to share the resources that we have. We cannot multiply the resources mm. and put them a waste when they are not used. Decentralizing mechanics, not only blockchain in terms of data, but everything. Mm. Decentralized ownership of cars. Decentralized... Oh, uh, even, even places like, uh, like AWS and Amazon Azure, or sorry, Microsoft Azure, recognize there's this clever thing, I think Google does it as well, mm. that they let you do. Um, which is you can rent what's called a spot instance, I think it's called. And so the idea of this is, let's say you have a big company and he reserves like 200 computers to run his service when it's at the max load. But while his service is not at the max load, he's still paying some to reserve, but not as much as if they're actually running and it's running smaller. But at any moment, his service could need to expand out to fill this whole volume and those computers are sitting there empty. So these services, these cloud hosting providers will actually resell that space at a lower cost to other people on the condition that say like uh, at a moment's notice their service could be shut down. Mm -hmm. So unlike an instance you pay full price for to keep your service running reliably, if you have some kind of background job that can run and it doesn't really matter how fast it gets done, you can put it on a spot instance which might be shut down, reclaimed at any moment by somebody else's volume, but you pay a lot less for it. Mm -hmm. This is like uh, the car sharing with the computers themselves. But think about internet service provider. They purchase from uh, backbones, uh, pipe uh, that can transport 100, but they resell 1,000. Mm. It's obvious that they cannot provide the 1,000 in full to all the clients, but they hope mm. that nobody's gonna research to get the maximum use uh, in all the time and they share the resource. I think that uh, now people profit in this uh, multiple sale of the same resource. Mm. I have one resource, I sell it five times, and I'm making more money because I hope that no five At people try to use... like some banker shit, right? Exactly. So, to make this uh, uh, situation honest, uh, I think that the centralization provides a tool uh, where everybody can put computation on their computer I use, and they are guaranteed by mathematics uh, to receive the correct uh, mm. reward, and people purchasing it, uh, they know they're not being cheated. So. And this gets back to one of the uh, 
before I even got into blockchain, I already liked decentralized systems. I thought Torrent was amazing. And one of the insights that occurred to me, which even to the point that I talked with a few guys about startup ideas related to this, and some, some of them have already been tried in certain forms, none of them particularly well, but it approaches, it's kind of the, the ideal goal of where we're going now is that uh, stop and imagine for a moment how many unused processor cycles there are mm -hmm. in the world. You know, in the moment that every big company has this whole room, like whole stories full of computers that sit there, you know, off at night or even powered on and not doing anything. And you have all these home computers, sometimes, you know, five or six home computers in a single house. And these people get on and they browse the internet for an hour and then they go and do something else, but they leave the computer on. Like, how much memory actually exists out there? How much processor power exists out there? that's unutilized and what could you accomplish if you actually put all of these resources into a network that people are able to rent even just when you're not using them the thing could be smart enough to figure out like okay if i want to play a game on my computer it's going to stop renting my computer but the minute i switch off the game and go to eat lunch it starts renting it out again and i make an income for this <laughs> resources that i have that is an interesting story that happened in the past and i witnessed is happening this company made uh, a secure uh, password access uh, and they calculated that it would take 100 years to a regular computer to break it. And they gave a $100,000 prize to whoever managed to break it. And I recall, and this is now it would make uh, sense because people is already used to distribute power and computation, but at the time the mentality was really the one that uh, a trick Satoshi Nakamoto, there is one computer, one vote, one computer, one processing. A guy made a screensaver, which was at the time, we're talking about Windows 95 uh, or things, that people who downloaded this screensaver with the fish, with beautiful girls, etc, etc. A free screensaver and uh, managed to promote it very well, after all it was free. That when, uh, and he didn't say this to people, but when the screensaver is running, you're obviously not using your computer. Mm. And in the moment, he was receiving block of uh, attempt to brute force at his security. And in less of a week, uh, he broke uh, and won the $100,000. Because they calculated 100 years for a single computer. Mm. But in the moment that this guy put thousands of computers and distributed the workload between mm. thousands of computers, he managed to break... Uh, the uh, security of this company quite fast and has been quite uh, interesting to see how uh, decentralized in the world well, yes you, you realize you say it, like this guy he wasn't even like paying for computing resources to you this was the computing resources that are sitting unused by everybody's computer all the time and and so so this is worth to note that we're not the only people to recognize this. There are other projects in the blockchain space that are tackling parts of this problem. You know, you have, for file storage, you have, I forget the names of some of them now. You have like- Storage A. Storage A, this IPFS kind of thing. We're trying to tackle file storage and many others. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure, although I know even less about the names of these projects off the top of my head, there are others that are trying to handle decentralized computation, you know, to, to be able to plug in your computing resources and blah, blah, blah. But with, uh, with the second version of ZooBC technology, we want to take some versions of each of these things and put them together. You know, like you have, uh, it, at the moment that you just have memory, then you have memory. And at the moment that you just have processors, then you have processors. But at the moment you can put memory and processors together at the disposal of an application on the same network, now, you have an operating system. Now you have the capacity to build a full application that actually accomplishes something with each of those tools. And so we want to try to uh, assemble a system that lets people put their own hardware on the network, run computers in their house and plug it into the network even, you know, and then get paid for the use that people make off of these things to run their applications and their websites. So this probably in version two, we don't get all the way there, but certainly I think we already have the vision that 20, 50 years from now, however long it takes, this is how the internet is going to work. Yeah, I think that this is what we're working on. And correctly, what Barton was highlighting is that if you have the different components that are separated, that don't belong to the same ecosystem, it's hard to make them work together. Mm -hmm. Not impossible, but hard. Uh, ZBC structure, uh, the way that uh, 
all the network work together by allowing to distribute the work that has to be done, yet uh, monitoring on each other mm. and distributing the reward in the correct uh, way, uh, which is a powerful thing. And uh, correct as Martin was saying, go read the white paper. <laughs> you you go read the white paper <laughs> because there are a lot of interesting things. <clears throat> in the moment that this evolve, uh, I think there are a set of priorities and there are a lot of things that can be done that are accessories, so are the implementation. So let's say when you have your computer, you can run a video game, you can run a software to do architectural, AutoCAD, uh, animations, whatever it is. But there are some services that are at the base of everything to make things work. Mm -hmm. So when you copy and paste, you are calling some operating system functionality that all your copy and paste is not recoded in every software that you use, mm -hmm. to give a practical example. But uh, when you access a file, uh, the management of the file system is handled by the operating system, is not handled by... And so in the internet itself, uh, when you visit the website, you use TCP IP as uh, mechanics to locate uh, in the network, the server, uh, the IP address, use the DNS to convert the domain name in IP address mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Those are many things that people give for granted uh, that are not necessary to be re-implemented when you build an application because they are there and they are standards. In uh, evolving the information era phase two, to the decentralization, uh, there is a need uh, to recreate uh, similar standards uh, mm. when uh, giving the basis for the implementation of a decentralized uh, everything. Email, decentralized emails, web uh, storage and website uh, and smart website, uh, decentralized identity management, banking, uh, rather mm. than uh, shopping, etc., etc. Many people already did. We have a friend that did a very successful uh, uh, Amazon.com or Alibaba.com on the blockchain uh, where people can open their shop and do shopping. But that is a blockchain that is implemented exclusively to provide that service. Hmm. We need something more general. We need something that is like uh, underlying platform technology that allow easily to implement uh, the shopping cart if you want rather than anything else by allowing resources to come together mm. and be managed properly right absolutely so i think it's interesting now to start things so oh somebody wrote the question just oh, if we can even see it <laughs> are we able to see it <laughs> oh my god does zuby see have a plan something it went away no we're gonna Look, all right, whoever's right. asking the question, we're gonna, we're gonna, we appreciate your question. Maybe we go we, we, we find a way to, to, to reach <laughs> Thank you for your patience. The, uh, no, I think it's very interesting to support the idea that, uh, or to, to go a little bit deeper into the idea. Because these things that we're saying right now, so far we're laying out a general vision, right? And it's not so rare that people have the vision for how, I mean, already very few people have the vision for how this thing is going to be. But of those even fewer have the idea of how to get there, know kind of where to put their feet along the path mm. to start to take steps. And so these are some of the ideas that we're starting to have for this ZooBC version 2. For example, if you read our white paper in the ZooBC version 1, you'll see that we have a structure that we call the node registry. And this means that uh, there's so each person is allowed to submit a request basically they join a line when they wait in line to see if they can get into the blockchain and then their computer becomes one of the computers on the blockchain that actually creates blocks that's actually trusted by the network to mean something and it's a uh, and this is kind of a privileged position you earn coins by working on the blockchain if you're in the group if it's proven that you're not doing the work you're supposed to do you get kicked out of the group and things like this so at the moment in ZooBC version 1, um, a person who puts their computer in this list, that represents only that one computer which does the basic job of the blockchain. And this is how almost every blockchain operates, that one node is one computer. So one of the places we plan to go in the ZooBC version 2 to move towards this uh, picture of reality that we're looking at is that a single person, really, these spots in the registry represent individual people more than they represent individual computers. And so 
we want somebody who has a spot in this list who's been trusted by the network and has shown the goodwill of doing all the work and is taking the rewards for their work to not only put themselves a single computer, but actually to be able to register a cluster of computers, to be able to register multiple computers that are owned and under the authority of this one person who's trusted by the network. Um, and the network itself can keep accounting of how much computer resources this person is contributing to the network. These computers put by, say, one person become part of the collective real estate, part of the collective cloud of this uh, ZooVC version 2 blockchain where each of these computers can take on some particular amount of processing or work by applications that other people actually develop and run on the thing. So this is one way that we move a step closer from being a conventional blockchain like a Bitcoin or Ethereum where you know one, one person owns one computer, that's two, <laughs> one person owns one computer. Um, now we move towards one person, it's acknowledged, owns, contributes as much computing resources as they want. And the algorithms that power the blockchain will try to decentralize not just across the number of computers in the network, but decentralize across the number of owners in the network to make sure that they're not colluding with each other. It's true that uh, in a term of decentralization, it's very hard to say who's behind something, right? Mm. So, and what there is behind something, the idea is that the system that decentralized trying to forcefully uh, put people in condition of this or that, uh, tend to find uh, a strong force of people trying to go behind those mm -hmm. restrictions in order to take particular advantage. In the moment that uh, things uh, evolve uh, organically, then uh, um, is more favorable for people to follow the rule, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, not following the rule is a damage to them. Mm -hmm. beside that to the community, right? Uh, yeah. I do believe that uh, um, as the society work uh, with the basic trust on the people, mm -hmm. right? If you think we live in a society that is based on trust, mm -hmm. if you had no trust, uh, I wouldn't be able to sit here because I, I implicitly trust the person that built this building not to collapse. You trust the people who live next door not to come inside and steal your stuff. Exactly. Or I trust when I walk on the sidewalk that the driver in the car doesn't, uh, you know, come and kill me. So we have a lot of implicit trust where people can do because it happened that the car killed the person, happened that the neighbor come and steal, happened that the building collapsed, right? Mm. But the, the damage of the exception to the majority are uh, limited and uh, don't affect uh, the quality of the global thing. Okay. So yeah. only where uh, there is a forceful uh, restriction that annoys everybody, you're going to have a, a large protest. Mm. But usually when a single person does a damage that not only damages themselves but the others, you get the collectivity mm. to go there and kick their butt <laughs> through delegation, like through the law enforcement, mm or in person, as uh, in many places this happens. And this uh, will stop people from doing something that the society doesn't like, right? In uh, a decentralized system uh, that can provide the services of sort, I think the same mechanics apply. Mm -hmm. With the difference that uh, the monitoring and the being upset or the law enforcement of it mm -hmm. is given by code, right? So because uh, the majority anyway decide the good or the bad. Mm. I think that the mechanics where uh, the function are set by the majority behavior self-regulates. Mm. So the ideal platform will have uh, a mechanics that accommodate uh, the behavior of a majority of the participants. Mm. And that will create a, a potential secure system where security means uh, what the majority wants. Right? There's, there's a lot of mechanisms that I think where we, uh, we go back to trying to rely on the free market. So we don't, we don't want to trust just that people are going to be good people because, because we've seen in the real world that's not always true, but people are good people when their interests align with them being good people. There's, there's ways to formalize this, like for example in, uh, 
in game theory, uh, the formal concept is called a Nash equilibrium. And this is uh, so where two players in a competitive game against each other, they're both trying to get the most, right? The Nash equilibrium is where they both settle on the same strategy that maximizes both of their rewards. So neither player could change behavior and take more rewards. But because this becomes stable, both players can depend on each other to play this exact strategy. Yeah. And so this is, uh, and this, this functions into things like uh, economics. Like in many cases, this becomes, uh, like on the macro scale, this becomes supply and demand economics, you know? So it's, uh, it makes sense that if a resource, let's, let's imagine in our blockchain, right? That there's a, a scarcity of computing power and a lot of people want computing power. So we can have the network automatically increase the price of computing power and then which and this price is not being collected by some company or by some it's being collected by the people who provide the computing power. So now if it pays a lot to put computing power, a yeah. lot of people who didn't think it's worth before are going to get computers and put them on the network to serve the needs and take the money. And exactly. this eventually brings down the cost also. On the other hand, if there's too much, if, if there's 10,000 people who want to provide power for 100 people who need the power, then the cost for each of them is very little, and so most of them don't waste their money. And we achieve an equilibrium that's Absolutely. based on the actual need. And this is the base of balancing a decentralized system. Because in the moment that the decentralized system was ruled, decided by a single person, then it's centralized. Hmm. If they are enforced by a single entity, then it's even more centralized. Mm. So the rule set should be obvious, should use a lot of common sense, and should self-balance by the market aspect of request and mm. offer. And uh, not, nobody says that if there is somebody who has larger drive because tomorrow they're very cheap, uh, automatically it's cheaper to mm. have a storage, right? <laughs> if it is very hard because suddenly they don't provide the drive anymore, mm. it's automatically going to go up. And that's something that cannot be controlled. And this would affect anyway also large companies that are piling up uh, mm. drives uh, to offer storage yeah. that is centralized. There, there are other kind of mechanisms potentially that can help put people in control. like. We acknowledge the fact that uh, the rules of any system can probably be gamed by a clever enough person who seeks to abuse the rules in most cases. And so uh, one thing, for, for example, I was just thinking, this isn't the final idea, it's very half-baked, but I throw it out because that's what we're talking about. So uh, let's say, for example, there's a person on the network who owns some computing resources who notoriously, in say multiple instances, has started to serve those resources to other people and cheated them somehow. He says he's gonna save a file and then he gives the wrong file or he doesn't save it at all and blah, blah, blah. But maybe he skirts the rules just enough that he hasn't been kicked out, you know? And so, but humans are smart enough to know that this guy is not behaving reliably. He's not doing what he's supposed to do. Individual app creators could even have tools to do things like blacklist particular node owners. That they say, you know, they, you know, if, if they keep a community idea of like these guys, like, look, you can go back and see the times that they tried to cheat. The network's not quite smart enough to kick them out completely. They figured out how to game the rules, but we don't have to give them the business. Yeah, the, the, the mechanics for how the monitoring of the honest participation is done mm -hmm. should be left uh, clickable by majority vote. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's yeah. the interest of the community that things are okay, so people will vote for things to be okay, right? I think that uh, is, at the end of the day, the base of the democracy, right? Mm. So you ask people to vote for what they believe is the correct choice. I would just uh, add the small aspect of uh, verifying that people know what they're voting about. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, It's just very difficult to prove automatically, unfortunately. <laughs> but it's also true that... Uh, higher the reputation is of a person, more consistent will be their suggestion mm. and more weight their uh, opinion should be, which in principle, in principle work. When this, then there is a... this even is an opportunity to talk about another cool thing, because Roberto just mentioned that it should be the majority that gets to vote. But I think that uh, even we can do better on this, not better than the majority necessarily, but we can do better in the sense that different kinds of applications have different kinds of needs for governance. So, in fact, the, a couple of levels that I'm thinking ZubiC dApps might actually have, decentralized applications, if you want, is uh, 
So the simplest form of governance is that you have one central monarch. So you have one guy who owns the project, and he's the one everybody trusts to continue. In programming circles, this is called the uh, BDFL, right? The beneficial dictator for life of the project, who everybody kind of looks up to and expects to set the tone and to make the final decisions, even in an open source project. And so this is kind of the most restrictive centralized form of governance. From there, that person could eventually elect to open decisions about the thing to a collective, either to a council of people who are trusted by the community who get to take a vote, or a direct democracy of the people in the blockchain itself. And eventually, in, in order to make changes about the protocol, about how the application works, and eventually this could escalate to the uh, probably the, the most stable kind of governance, which is after it's been tested enough and people are solid enough and they really like the state that something's in, those people, whatever the voting mechanism is, could vote to make the state of it immutable in the sense that they turn off governance for the features from here forward. Mm. This sounds strange at first. I can see that you're thinking that's uh, like, why would you do this and lose control? But there's a very good reason because eventually we want these D apps not only to exist in their own bubbles, but to construct on each other. And there's a danger here, oh, which, is, change the, the which is that if my DApp depends on yours and then yours changes its interface, then mine breaks. But if you've committed your interface to be immutable from here forward, now it becomes a stable brick that I can set mine on top of. And mine can go through the phases where I start it centrally controlled by me, then I open it to a democracy, and eventually it stabilizes mm. and becomes immutable, mm. and somebody else can build a brick on top of that. So yeah, yeah, I think is uh, is is clear is a beautiful thing. If you think about smart contract in Ethereum, the the big issue is that you deploy them and that's it; they're immutable immediately, mm. right? Uh, Which is not bad always, but it shouldn't bad. be the only option. <laughs> exactly, it probably is uh, cute to have something that is deployed, is tested, the bug, mm. and probably can be declared to be in beta version mm -hmm. as soon as it goes uh, in uh, stable release. Uh, let's say, then is locked. Mm -hmm. uh, to this functionality is recognized with an ash for the application yeah. on itself uh, and uh, and is relied on which it, is a very ethereum has some very blunt tools to allow this for example you can put kind of a gateway contract in front of your smart contract which allows which just makes a pointer to it right so i can set up one immutable contract which says i'm the one who owns this contract and at any time i can change where this one points to so that allows me to change the underlying logic whenever I want. But this doesn't really give me any path forward to prevent myself from changing it in the future, unless maybe I could code it to allow myself Absolutely. to shut it off. But the idea is this is kind of a hack around the way that Ethereum was thought about in the first place, you know, which is that there's supposed to be immutable contract already. Mm -hmm. And I think that this concept could be improved and generalized and made more explicit in the contract of the software so that it's not a surprise that somebody can switch the thing out from under you. If it's still in a state where it can change, everybody can see that it's still in a state where it can change and they can see who has the power to change it. And at the end, when it becomes immutable and nobody's allowed to make a change to that system anymore, even the guy who created it is not allowed to undeploy it. It's Absolutely. part of the network now. Other things can start to depend on that to exist. And this is the way that we start to build up the levels of software and layers on top of each other like bricks until it becomes a sturdy, decentralized ecosystem of tools. I think that's <laughs> super cool. Uh, so something cool came out today in uh, the high level uh, approach and vision on uh, this uh, decentralization uh, part second phase uh, of uh, the information age that we are into it we are happy and very glad to be shaping the history as it goes uh, with our contribution i think uh, we are close to one hour we want to say i want to say a shout out to my mom, Ellen. <laughs> Thanks to that person who asked us a question. Sorry, we couldn't read it. Incredible. We we are slowly getting organized, and I promise we're gonna have something in the computer where we can read the chat. But we are very busy people, and uh, when we do the broadcast, we usually have like half an hour before we start doing the this broadcast to start organizing and change the position of the cameras and all. Um, <laughs> 
what are we here? See, this is to give a little bit more perspective that we're sitting here. I have a nice bottle of water with me and uh, we have a beautiful uh, system to change the angles. It's a keyboard of the... if you want to type. <laughs> <laughs> I have a microphone. But um, yeah, thank you everybody for uh, joining and following. We know that compared to the zero audience that we usually have at least two people because I saw another two messages coming up where they're looking at us or commenting in our live stream so Monday there is the series one that we do for uh, our uh, blockchain talks uh, and next Friday is going to be another fantasy brainstorming on ZBC ciao till next time